Welcome everybody back to Velo Sound. It's our interview Sunday and today um, I have a guest that I'm pretty sure most, most, most of you will know. Um, <laughs> I have a fortune to talk to Jarbo today. So thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you. Fantastic. So the first question that I, for a few weeks, have been asking all my interview partners, and that is an important one. What is the band shirt or merch of the day on your site? Oh, on my side, um, yeah. that would be the reissue of Sacrificial Cake on vinyl, double Ooh, vinyl. That is a good one. Yeah, yeah so it's, comes... it's, it's lavender. The, the vinyl is colored lavender yeah. because of the song Lavender Girl. And any band shirt that you're wearing today? So for everybody who's just, you know, thinking of what I'm wearing, I'm wearing a Have a Nice Life shirt, one of my favorite bands. I don't wear band shirts. <laughs> oh, okay. At least that's honest. So where are we catching you right now? Roswell, Georgia. Oh, that's close to where, where I stayed for a year um, in Macon. Mm -hmm. Well, sort of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, that's, for, that's, for the that's standard, quite... like, I'm sitting here in Europe, and you're that's in true. Georgia. Right? Yeah, yeah, Macon is quite, quite south of here. This is up north. Yeah. How far is it, like? Three hours? Uh, I, I don't know, but th this is a, the north of Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. So, I, of course, one of the questions is always, how did you yourself get through the pandemic that is haunting our globe for the last two and a half years now? Uh, I would say the main things were um, the use of a a, the Rogue Echo bike, which is a stationary bike that moves your arms as well as your, as well as of course your legs, mm -hmm. and using that is quite strenuous. And then an, uh, an incline uh, treadmill, mm -hmm. and so all my exercise went inside because they even closed down the local park. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So I did. So I started doing that. So focusing on my health, basically, just exercising a lot inside. And, um, you know, and, and, and just working on music and um, just internal things, reading books and just focusing. And I did not go anywhere. I stay completely isolated for a very, very, very long time. Which is very strenuous, right? I mean, like I have mm, lots of know. living with most of my family in my house. but No, it doesn't bother me. I, I'm... Uh, pretty much a loner, pretty much, uh, you know, can entertain myself quite easily. Okay. I've always had that skill. And, um, but other than that, I, I've now received five vaccines mm -hmm. and I've been healthy. I haven't had the virus. And so I've been, you know, doing, doing okay in that regard. So I hope for you that uh, that's going to stay that way. I'll, I'll knock on mm -hmm. you. Um, mm -hmm. You also already mentioned the reason for our interview, and that is the reissue of sacrificial sacrificial cake sorry mm -hmm. um how did you come up with the idea to re-release your second album this was basically the label reaching out to me um wanting to uh reissue some of my uh catalog mm -hmm. and so they had done something for some friends of mine and so i went ahead and and i thought well okay it's just a vinyl release because i already have the the digital release out out there so it's just a special vinyl release and the packaging is lovely and they were very nice to work with so it just seemed like a good um a good thing to do and uh i'll probably um reissue uh the cd myself at some point mm -hmm. but right now it's just focusing on this vinyl and then the digital is all over the place so it's also interesting, you already mentioned that uh, the color scheme of it is lavender because of mm -hmm. the song Lavender Girl, which mm -hmm. is that like a little a little nod to your fans? Because I mean, like we all know that Lavender Girl is one of, it's like a fan favorite, right? Well, when I look at my uh, most played, um, that is consistently right up there at the top. There's a few songs that are just consistently at the top, and that is one of them. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that that's one of them. And um, 
Volcano is the other one, and uh, Within, a song that I did with Neurosis, that would be another one. And those are just consistently at the top. But Lavender is, is like a big favorite. <laughs> so we also, of course, want to think a little bit back on that time, on the time of writing and recording, and also then later on releasing Sacrificial yes. Cake. So, what is your memory of recording the record? Was it a pleasant experience or would you say oh, yeah. like, that was a hard to make record? No, it was wonderfully fun. It was a fantastic experience. Um, you know, because some of the people involved are very cool. I mean, Michael was involved in this partly and Larry Seven, Larry Seven that I did Beautiful People Limited with was involved and Michael Evans, incredible New York City drummer who's now deceased, he played on it and he was an interesting drummer, like he played hubcaps, you know, and it was very cool. And the album was, you know, organically recorded. It's, it's, it's mostly, um, you know, analog recording instead of digital recording and it was a lot of fun making it but this this whole section of my life this time frame when this was being written and recorded and put together what coincided with the time frame that i in new york when i was uh going to the the kala chakra endowment uh from the dalai lama at madison square garden at the paramount theater and there was a, a several weeks there in new york city of uh meditation in central park with the dalai lama and concerts by the monks and it was a lot of activities um in, in new york around that time with the, with the year of tibet and so i went to every single one of those um those uh, uh, events, including the Dalai Lama receiving a Nobel Peace, Pro Peace Prize at Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was um, during this time period when I began um, deep into my exploration of Tibetan Buddhism. So that, that of course, brings about the title, because the sacrificial cake is the Torma. And the Torma are the sacrificial cakes used in Tibetan Buddhist ceremonies as offerings to deities. Mm -hmm. So just for my recollection, wasn't that also the year when the Beastie Boys held that uh, Free Tibet concert? Or was that later? I think that was, I think that may have been later when they came on board with the activities for, for Tibet. But of course, that was also basically influenced by the Dalai Lama being in New York, um, I guess at least. Mm -hmm. um, so to point it out, the record was released as a standout, but it, several of the tracks were then later also combined with several of the tracks from Michael Jira's Trainland. Mm -hmm. um, how did it happen that those two records seemed to have a strong connection? Well, we were, you know, living together and involved in each other's creative efforts at the time. So it's just, just a natural, a natural extension of that. Um, he went to the, uh, I think he went to two of the Buddhist events with me. But I remember we walked, we, we had to walk. Uh, I was told to walk to these events rather than to take the subway or, or a cab. And so I remember we got up quite early and we walked all the way to Central Park for the meditation with the Dalai Lama. And, but both records were not recorded simultaneously, right? We, no, we recorded Drainland uh, with Bill Rieflin in Seattle. All right. So what always strikes me when I listen to Sacrificial Cake is that it has this amazing mix of sounds, you know, it's partially partially industrial, partially um, ambient, very rocky in parts, of course. Um, and it has a great emotional feeling, you know, I think that everybody who listens to the record knows that this is not your run of the mill. Somebody's talking about peace, love and pancakes. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember any certain musical influences on the songwriting of sacrificial cake i would say it was mostly a spiritual influence rather than anything else because i was deeply involved in these studies and you know it was just that the title brings it all together because the the cakes are 
you know, they form part of the eight offerings of external worship, as well as a part of the offerings of the five senses. So the five senses are considered internal worship. So then that would be, um, you know, presentation to the wrathful tantric deities. Mm-hmm. And the, the cakes are, you know, they're modeled to resemble parts of the human body. So this was what I was exploring on this album was, you know, this, so-called quote human experience quote unquote so you know all the, the songs touch on themes i mean spiral staircase is, is is hinting at a murder and it's also hinting at an affair mm-hmm. and you know and 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 wrath you know jealousy o to v the v stands for vagina so those are uh, archaic terms and urban terms for the female orgasm and vagina yeah. Um, and so, and of course, my buried child was written by Michael, and um, you know they're all they're all over the place. Uh, the tragic seed, you know, that's um, was specifically thinking about the 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 seed, i.e., the 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 unborn child inside the stomach of Sharon Tate when she was brutally murdered by the Manson family. So that was a, a, the tragic seed. Is is this unborn child and, and that was killed during the murders. But when you are talking about Tragic Seed already, it's the way that I I have the image. Uh, so you're basically, of course, talking about Polanski. So mm-hmm. the tragedy of it is p- probably for you that they were in love and mm-hmm. then this tragedy itself happened, that she was murdered. It's not The tragedy mm-hmm. is not having conceived a child but the tragedy is of the child being unborn so right yeah that's exactly what the inspiration was for that and and, and troll the troll lullaby and the song troll those were inspired of uh, vivid memories that i have from taking lsd when i was a teenager mm-hmm. and so this was basically seeing the god pan and he walks towards me <laughs> and uh, i can still see him in my mind and the funny thing was, is at the time I, I had not studied mythology and I didn't know who Pan was. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so then this, you that's... had an, basically a dream of something that to you at that time was completely unknown. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, did, a, a, a hallucination, yes. Did that, did that then in turn again strike up your, your curiosity? Well, I later went on to take mythology courses in college, so I learned <laughs> I learned who I was seeing as a virginal girl, yes. I also pretty much like the one of the quotes that you've put onto Bandcamp when you call the record a storybook of dreams and nightmares. So uh-huh. you just refer to one of your dreams. Um, do, do you do you keep track of them like a diary or do you rely on your emotional memory? I used to. I have volumes, boxes of journals. And then I did an album called Dreams, which is was a, a it was an experiment to keep paper and pencil by the bedside and then to deliberately uh, train myself to wake up at night so that I would write down the dream I had just had. And so all of the lyrics were scribbled unintelligent, unintelligently. Uh, during these moments, and that whole album came together based on actual dreams. So that was a, a very specific use of dreams to to write lyrics. That is a very interesting idea because we all know that if you train yourself to do certain things during nighttime, and you can internalize them so much that, up to a certain extent, you do them without consciously knowing you do them Mm -hmm. right yes Uh was there ever any moment where you woke up and looked at the things you wrote and a didn't remember it and b couldn't read it no i always remembered it i always uh had a visual memory and 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 it was quite vivid that was that's what was interesting about it and it was also kind of cathartic because one of the songs um i was revisiting uh, people that I loved and and people that I had loved but never met um, that had died. And so I was 
kind of experiencing my awareness of them. So that's perhaps the most emotional of all of the all of the of the songs and dreams. Then sacrificial cake is that a kind of diary of that time 93 94 or are there you as you just mentioned there are also older dreams and older nightmares that you had on that record right yeah i think so and and definitely inspired by the year of tibet and also um there's a lot of visualization going on in uh tibetan uh, ceremonies and so the visualizations of the deities that is something that is is more extreme than any lsd trip you could ever take and so i think that those uh kind of opened things up in my in my mind and it was like a portal mm -hmm. which is a very interesting explanation of course uh for for music that seems to have or that not only seems to have, but has such an emotional impact on a lot of people. Were you, were you in any way aware of what you were doing right there? Would open up a lot of doors for. Yes, yes, I was. I had researched it in advance, and I knew exactly how uh, intense it was going to be, mm -hmm. and it didn't disappoint me. I, I mean, many, there's, but these, these are. These are these songs are, are really a collection of, 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 of kind of fables and, and fairy tales. Um, the body lover is is you know it, it's definitely it's intended to be a, a gothic poem, and it's it's very uh, melodramatic in a way, and it's it's touching on a on the subject of a grave digger who uh, actually digs up the graves and then sells. Uh, parts of the corpse or the entire corpse. And this was something that went on for a while uh, in history. And, and so that he's intended to be someone in England and he's, he's um, digging up these graves and, and uh, he's, a, he's a bit of a, becomes a bit extreme with his treatment of some of the uh, corpses, but he gets paid money and he just sort of changes and becomes someone who's just kind of um, taking the money and, um, you know, getting drunk and just kind of like going wild in the streets, you know, and he just becomes obsessed with this. So, so I think this is one of my most successful poems, "The Body Lover," and that's definitely right up there in the the fairy tale department, the dark fairy tale department. <laughs> yeah. Be, being an English teacher, I have to ask that: Were you aware that that special story seems like a spin-off of? Frankenstein, because at the beginning of Frankenstein, we have Victor, who also reassembles his monster with the help of a grave digger who brings in parts. No, I wasn't. Yeah, I can see that. But I wasn't thinking about Frankenstein. I was mostly thinking about this group of people that were, um, you know, even stealing jewels and things that were buried with people, and then, uh, uh, and then, of course, the the doctors that just wanted the cadavers to, to experiment, you know, to to explore science, because there was a time when they couldn't get the bodies legally, and so they had to pay these people to bring them corpse cadavers so they could practice their, um, you know, their their science, their profession as doctors. So I was mostly thinking about that era. And then it kind of veered off to the idea that he was also, uh, you know, quite perverted, and that he would become obsessed with this one particular body of a girl. So, so it's he's he's um, so it ends with him just talking about the the poem ends with just talking about how lovely that she was, that you know, how tempting she was as a virgin. But then it says that she was ravished only by death, so he didn't ravish her. It's, it's very interesting, you know, also thinking about the the backgrounds of those stories, just like you said, the 19th century, 18th, 19th century, you know, when, when people were exploring a lot in science, but at the same time were condemned if they did, which to us seems totally illogical. Um, and then, like you said, the grave digger, who's not even a part of regular society because of his job, so he's an outsider. 
is that also something that interested you in general in your work you know the lives of outsiders of people that are not your typical people that you read in history books i haven't really thought about that i would say um just you know what draws uh one's interest is just kind of based on your trajectory through life you know i mean i i majored in english literature and i i had a particular love of lord byron for a while so i i think that um you know, my teachers thought I was going to be a, a, a writer, and and, and I, I think that this, this all the different um, eras of, of English literature that I've studied have all came to uh, come come into play, came into play during an album such as this. Mm-hmm. And there were some songs on 13 Mass where that happened as well, where it's just you're kind of using things that you have learned, you know, and the love of language itself. I think there is also another connection point to to one of the tracks on Sacrificial Cake, not logical, um, because one of the key lines in that song is open your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, That's the repeated, repeated uh, refrain, yes. Yeah, right. And I mean, like, that is also something like, which reflects in a lot of philosophers of the 18th century, like sapre aude, be, uh, mm-hmm. be brave enough to use your mind. Um, mm-hmm. So it's very interesting. I mean, like we, you are talking about it from a Gothic perspective. You are talking about it from a literary perspective. We've already touched on history. I'm very sure that you didn't sit down and, and wanted to write such multifaceted stories and lyrics. Did that just come as a natural flow or was it really like, okay, like, like Nick Cave, I have to sit down from nine to five and do some work. I would say it was a natural flow. I don't, I don't ascribe to that aforementioned method. I know people that do that. You, know, you mentioned one. He, he does that. And um, I think Michael, uh, the whole time I lived with Michael, he did that. Uh, he had that method as well. And that's not something that I do at all. <laughs> Is that also something that you did not do when you worked with swans? So that you were like the chaotic element in in all of that? Well, you know, after rehearsals, the grueling rehearsals, they would all go out. They would all go out to the various bars Mm -hmm. um, pretty much all night long. I never did. After the rehearsal, I cleaned up the rehearsal space, aired it out, and um, sat to work on my Casio writing my own songs. Mm -hmm. And so that's all I did was just, you know, 100% focusing on writing and um, reading books. And then if I wanted to go out for a walk, I would go out by myself at four o'clock in the morning and walk for, you know, 90 minutes alone. Through the streets of New York City, which... All the time, every night, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but which I just wanted to say, like, which back then, at the beginning of the 90s, I mean, like, it wasn't, it wasn't Son of Sam anymore, but I can imagine that you had some... Can we call them creepy experiences for when you did those strolls? Yeah, it was mid late eighties, the nineties, and you know things had not become gentrified in that neighborhood. But I would walk all the way up to you know Midtown. Mm-hmm. I would take you know Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue, and and I would walk. Uh, a regular walk was to go all the way over to the, the farthest west side of the island, mm-hmm. and. You know, I never had any problems. I mean, I, I, I learned very easily the techniques to uh, not get mugged and to not get um, attacked. And so that would be walking primarily in the middle of the street, never the sidewalks, mm-hmm. and um, uh, wearing very baggy clothing, covering, you know, as much of yourself as you could, mm-hmm. uh, not attracting anything. And then um, the other would be... Uh, uh, you know, swinging something in your hand like a glass bottle, mm-hmm. or um, so uh, my key. That you got some kind of weapon. Or yeah, and on my, uh, on my yeah, and on my keys, I had a large crucifix, a large crucifix on it, a large cross on it, and um, so that gave the impression that inside that would be a knife. And so I, I never had any um, any problems. I, I could. I, I also developed the skill to see potential danger far away, 
and you develop kind of like eyes all around your head. And so I could see there was something suspicious coming up, you know, and then you would just automatically go the other way, you know. And so this is kind of, you develop those, the radar for danger. I developed the radar for danger because in those days you had to. I mean, like as interesting as the era is, of course, in New York history, it's also one of those where where I'm not sure if I would have liked to live in it. Although, of course, cre creative wise, creativity wise, it's an amazing time. Um, mm -hmm. When let's let's get back to to the idea of not logical, you know, people having to open your mind. Back then, did you perceive mankind to be living with a closed mind? Like not seeing what is possible. This no, this this song is uh, is meant to be um, uh, you know humorous. It's meant to be ironic and kind of sarcastic because yeah. of the combination of the words. It's yeah, like saying, "Oh well, well, oh well." This so this isn't logical. So let's open your mind to these mm -hmm. things. And so, you know, I'm deliberately um, using juxtapositions there that that are. Uh, you know, perhaps at odds and perhaps, you know, so it's like, it's like, this is, this is kind of the, the idea. So let's open your mind to this. So, you know, what about maniacal, you know, what about homosexual? What about heterosexual? What about, you know, bestial? What about, let's, let's go to all these places, but anything except conventionality. So the whole mm -hmm. point there was to be, un to question uh, conventionality, to qu question conventions and to, question your um what's holding you back what's what's what rigid you know prison have you put around yourself and so it's it's like expand your horizons open yourself up and this is very important thing to do was a very important thing to do for me anyways because this this happened to me early on when i was looking for something outside of the what I was taught or told was the expected. And the important thing there is it can happen in any field. It can happen in art, it can happen in literature, and it can happen in music and, mm -hmm. or fashion or design, you know. And so with me, it was this search or, or interest in things that were not on the radio at the time. And so that's what led to listening to, uh, uh, going to, to find un kind of underground music And then there was a radio show late at night on Sunday night on a, a college radio station, WREK, which is the Georgia te uh, Tech. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of very brilliant people graduate. And Yellow so Jack, this radio, right? Georgia the, yeah, Jack. yeah, the te technology. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of uh, computer people to go yeah. degree and designers and engineers. So there was this wonderful radio show come on late at night. And they were playing the groups that I, uh, you know, came to love. So that's where I first heard SPK, and that's where I first heard, you know, Einstein's and Neubauten, and, and then that is where I first heard Swans. I heard Power for Power, and so these, um, you know, kinds of sounds uh, were very inspiring to me because they didn't follow the traditional uh, melodic and, and song structure type elements. And mm -hmm. so that's what led me to, um, to meet the people that were putting on the show. Mm -hmm. Finally, it led to me working with the, the, the engineers there and actually using the studio to record my own experimental work. And that led to performing experimental work. And then that's what led to me sending some of that work to New York and, And then uh, getting the attention of uh, Michael Girard and then talking to him on the phone, flying up there and interviewing and going to the rehearsal. So that's what opened that whole portal was my, you know, interest of opening my mind uh, beyond the conventions of, of musical norms. Mm -hmm. Also opening your mind in order to question conformity. Oh, well, that's never been a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what I mean, right? You, you yeah. are, you yeah, are yeah. talking about, you know, yeah. bringing down yeah. the barriers of con conventionality. I mean, at the same time, yeah. you know, you, you, there, there must have been a denial of fitting into anything, right? Yeah, I, uh, 
It's interesting because I never have. I've always been um, a complete loner and I've always been um, kind of an introvert and uh, just more interested in reading a book than going to a party. So that's, you know, that, that kind of, um, you know, attitude is, it comes, has always come naturally to me. You've already mentioned one of my favorite bands of all time, Einstürzen Neubauten, which I mm -hmm. personally again saw a few months ago. Um, mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you remember what you thought or felt when you first heard anything by Neubauten? Or oh, do you just, maybe uh, also remember what you first heard? I don't remember what I first heard, but I think I just love the, uh, just the, the components of it. I mean, in a, in a way, I would say certainly it was industrial, but it was also tribal for me at the same time. So uh, everything about it, the singing, um, you know, Mark Chung, who was at that time the bass player, yeah. it was just very, very, um, uh, I just love them. I mean, I love them. I listen to them constantly. And, and of course, it was a real thrill um, in uh, March and spring and then summer of 1984 to to go to Berlin and, and um, to actually wind up staying with Blixa Bargeld in his apartment there and, and hanging out with them and meeting them because Swans was, was doing their first European tour. I wasn't in the group then, but I came along as the, the person who, who uh, lugged the stuff around, <laughs> the roadie. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that was a lot of fun because um, I was, again, the outsider. And I met, you know, a community of... Um, Partying, drinking, uh, you know, very uh, kind of crazy group of people, and <laughs> and I was the the, the um, you know I, at that time I was you know a, a, a bond I was studying boxing, a kickboxing, and I was very athletic. I had a buzz cut, so I guess you would say I was straight edge. Mm -hmm. So I was a very interesting element, I think, in that environment. <laughs> I can totally and, imagine. And of course, Alex Hocker was an Alexander Hocker was not one of those partiers. He was the one that intrigued me the most, and I love him. He's a good friend. He um, was very studious and very intense. Um, but the thing that I remember vividly about the apartment where Blix lived was um, when you came in the door of the hallway, you had his leather, his handmade, custom made leather uh, one piece suits with all the intricate stitching, and very much like. Um, you know, Edward Scissors, scissor hands, yeah. kind of that kind yeah. of thing. And you know, those would be hanging on, on pegs in the hallway. And it was, it was really beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So from one fan to the other, uh, we, we both know that at some point, right around the millennium, I would say, they, they aka Neubauten, turned into a more melodic kind of way. That's what right, do you think yeah. about that? Like, silence is sexy. Like, there is some very clear pop appeal on some of those songs what do you think about oh that? yeah i like, actually like it i think it's good uh the diversification and yeah. certainly swans did the same thing in a very extreme way <laughs> so mm -hmm. i mean spk did the same thing with metal dance so so yeah so it's not it's, it's it doesn't i think it's just uh reaching out doing something different and then again also maybe not doing something that other people would expect you to do right yeah i would say i would say and, so for sure and there is also there, there are some tracks on sacrificial cake which also hold that quality of of doing something that at first glance might not really fit into the record like i i remember first listening to yum yap and i was like <laughs> what does this have to do and i was but after a while, noticing, okay, yeah, it's not about doing something that I want, but it's something <laughs> listening to something that she wants, and in that context. So is that also important for you still to do things for yourself, to, to well, the, not fit into anybody's scheme of expectations? I mean, the little, the, in terms of uh, yum yab, I mean, that's a reversal of yab yum which is a Tibetan phrase, Yab Yum is the consort on top of the deity. Mm -hmm. So you reverse that, the deity is on the, the deity, deity is reversed where the consort is bigger than the deity straddling. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. her. And so that, what does that mean? Well, then, well, then that, what that translates to is mother, father. Mm -hmm. So mother, father was a song that I performed in Swans. And again, it's like, I also like the, the track musically because it's, it sounds a little bit like Manchester and like, again, industrial. And mm -hmm. that is also something that I felt when also going back to some of the earlier Swan records and then to the first Swan records when you joined. Were you aware that by joining, you would also change the direction of the band? Because um, you definitely did. I, I, I think uh, he, Michael acknowledged as early as the fall of 84 and then uh, uh, maybe around 85, the first show I did, I think he started acknowledging um, uh, the, uh, what, he, what he, he liked was the, um, the skill set that I brought up there. And so, so he, I introduced him to a lot of music. I mean, I came up there with some records and things that I loved. And so he hadn't heard um, a lot of that music, if any of that music. And mm -hmm. I think that he, um, you know, kind of acknowledged that, that I was teaching him, kind of expanding his horizons musically. And then when I was there at the studio that they performed in in uh, Sweden, no, Switzerland, Switzerland, uh, they were recording in Switzerland, and I uh, suggested doing his vocals, I suggested that he sing, that he do long descending notes, and that he stop kind of shouting. And so um, he's th that from that point on, he did it and he liked it. He, and he decided to, to try to keep, you know, expand more of a singing approach instead of the shouting approach that he had previously been doing. So I think he credits me for that, for teaching him um, basically how to sing. And so I think that this worked in reverse where, you know, he was wanting to, um, I guess, use or take advantage of what I could do. So in that way, it was music lessons and singing lessons. So some of the first vocals um, I did, I mean, I did a blood-curdling scream at the opening of Time is Money. And then I um, started doing choral vocals, background vocals on the Holy Money album, the Greed album, the Holy Money album, multiple layers of, of backing vocals. And that was kind of using the classical training. Mm -hmm using soprano, uh, uh, soprano tonalities. And then um, from then he had me, you know, sing, you know, to start doing singing. And so then that expanded into my um, being involved in the arrangements and where I would play melodies. And then that proceeded to me telling other musicians what they should play. So sometimes we'd have guest players come in and I would hum or sing or play the, what I heard for them to play and they would, they would do that. And so this definitely came to fruition with Children of God mm -hmm. where I um, was humming the parts to the flute player and, you know, humming the, and just kind of being involved in what other people were doing. And then, of course, with Burning World, I was, I mean, I sang the string section on, um, I guess it's goddamn the sun. I, I sang the, the string section to the to the players, you know, and 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 so they, that's what you hear there, the refrain, and is what I had, and then I sang to, I sang to a bunch of the musicians. We had Shankar fly all the way in from touring with Peter Gabriel and Shankar's uh, on the electric, uh, you know, the violin and all the stuff he'd done that album. I sang those parts to him. So so this was a you know an, a, I guess you'd call it a resource, an asset that Michael used. And so then of course that began to um, change the trajectory of the sound, just utilizing what somebody can, can bring to the table. But I have to say that I was very surprised um, how we went from Children of God to doing a cover of Love Will Tear Us Apart. And I um, rebelled against that. I, I did not like the pop version that he did with the lead vocal. And I voiced that in a very strong way. And so that led to going into Wharton Tears studio in New York. And uh, me, uh, I did my own version, which they called the black version. And that was just me and, and me playing the, the keyboards and doing the vocals. And then Norman came in and played some 
pickups and guitar. I mean, it was a very simple recording, and I think it's the superior recording. And I, I did it in a way of just really focusing and mentally feeling Ian Curtis. And I, I, I did it with all my heart and all my soul. And I, I really um, I think that that's the, the version of that song, not the pop version. I would even go so far as, I mean, we all have heard the original, and I hope that most people have heard Michael's version and your version. And I mean, like, there are some really shitty covers of that. We both know that. Um, mm -hmm. But I would still rank yours higher than Michael's and even higher than the original, because in yours, I feel what it's about. Uh, I like I like Joy Division, but I think your your version brings the text more to its meaning. When well, thank we talk, you. <laughs> you're welcome. And when we talk about you know the importance of a combination of music and lyrics, there is one track on Sacrificial Cake, which is very paradox. And that is, to me at least, deflowered. Because mm -hmm. musically, it's pure hippie bliss. It's like Laurel Canyon all over again. But the lyrics, they go somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the creation of that track? Well, during the time I wrote that track, um, there was this whole movement of... Um, the Grr girls, G R R R L girls, yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, the whole um, this whole grunge girl, and it was all yeah, about riot um, girls, right? Yeah. yeah, like punk girl bands and all this, and there was all this movement about this, and um, I think um, uh, rather humorously, tongue in cheek, I was um, commenting on, um, you know being a female in uh, rock music and so in the music business itself and from what I saw around me firsthand uh, without naming names <laughs> and, and that was that basically I'm alluding to you know giving a blowjob to a record executive in this song uh, and I'm alluding want, right? yeah. yeah and 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 I do it in a, and I do it in very um hopefully a very humorous kind of kind of a way and 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 so basically that's yeah so i'm not sure it could be more uh, you know when when i say to you know learn how to to scream and and uh seize every quote opportunity unquote right well the opportunity is you know what <laughs> yeah the opportunity is showing itself to you to do what you have to do to get to, to get ahead and of course you know no pun intended and of course you know actresses had to do the same thing and we all know about everything that came out about that yeah. so this was just all about that this is my my opinion about what you have to do and the cliche of you know leather pants and the the big guitar and of course that's going to lend you some credibility wearing those leather pants and so i mean it's just very sarcastic and mm -hmm. it's kind of a send up of that whole thing when we're talking about the, your position as a female artist and let's just simplify it and say the rock world were you aware that, or are you aware? I hope that you are. That you're like that you were, and still, for a lot of women, are like a forerunner of the third or second or whatever wave of amazing female artists. Like you know, we could start, of course, with lots of women from the fifties and sixties, and we could go to Debbie Harry, and but then you know, there is like this group of, of females in the nineties that were very successful for whichever reason, as we just said that. Did you notice that you also have a very special standing in the music world? No, not, not at all. Music wise, but also um, as a woman who is. No, um, I, I don't. I mean, I, I as again, I, I kind of have this outsider status, and I, um, I'm, I'm a loner. Were you and aware of, of that position? No, 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 not really. I mean, I mean, I would say that. Um, 
because sometimes people will send me uh, randomly throughout the years. I've had some friends send me like a, a list or something that they found online or some, mm-hmm. some, some uh, music magazine online and they'll send me this list and they'll say, Oh, look, your name is in there. So things like that have, have happened periodically, mm-hmm. but I, I, um, you know, it's just not something I think about. Um, I've had fans, uh, uh, girls, uh, young young women, come up to me after shows, and um, and, and say uh, you know things that that are, are very meaningful you know to me, and, and it, I'm always uh, you know very humble about it and and, and 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 flattered, you know. So I mean, that's 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 the only way that I would say I I'm aware of it, you know. How do you feel when that happens? When young women come up to you and thank you for that? Well, it depends on what they're, where they're headed. You know, if they're um, if they're headed towards um, you know a, a career in music. I mean, that's all changed now. I mean, now you can. Uh, you know, you don't have to go the the path of of the music business or record labels. Yeah. I mean, you can yeah. you can you can pretty much DIY and get your material online. But of course, then the problem is how you network it. And of course, there's all this social media stuff out there now. So if you really want to push it hard, you can you can push it hard on the social media and yeah. and sell yourself. So I mean, it's a lot different than being at the mercy of a um, A and R person mm-hmm. than the, which is the way it used to be. So we have a few questions left before we come to our infamous quickfire round. Um, okay. Being an artist who lived in New York and who lives in Georgia, are there any bands from America nowadays where you say, okay, those are acts that I really, really enjoy and that people should listen to more? Uh, from America, I mean, the first one that would come to mind would be the band Low. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from Dolores. But if I if uh, uh, and of course the other would be uh, two. I guess would be Kendrick Lamar and Flying Lotus. Okay, very. Diverse. Although I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure where Flying Lotus is from. But uh, but those are definitely three. I guess. But I mean, ter- you were talking about this list of 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 um, you know people that would perform at a festival or something. Yeah, if yeah, I was I, cur- that would be why, that would be one of my next questions. You know, like if you could curate. A one yeah. festival with four I, acts. But Which I could I couldn't keep <laughs> I couldn't keep it to four. If I was cura- if I was curating my dream festival, yeah. I would of course be watching all of it. I wouldn't be performing myself. Interesting. Okay. So <laughs> Cuz it would just would be too be amazing. Watching? Well, and and no in no particular order, yeah. right? I know yeah, yeah. no one's better than be, be a Baron under Club of Gore. Ooh, that, that is a very good band. I've seen them live. That is a very well, good band. Yeah, well, I played with them in Moscow. I played with them at the House of Artists in Moscow, mm-hmm. and it was an incredible concert. My God. Anyway, um, then it would be Warjuna. Mm-hmm. Ooh. And then it would be Heilung. Ooh, now we're going into a very interesting and, direction. Okay. <laughs> and then it would be Void of Voices, Attila's solo performance. Yeah. And then it would be Sun, Stephen O'Malley and Greg yeah. Anderson's group. Yeah, who's also been on our show. Like two very cool guys, Stephen and Greg. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah, I love them. I yeah. love them. I mean, that's a show that I will not miss. Um, yeah, and then of course I mentioned Flying Lotus and, and Kendrick Lamar and Lo. Oh, that would be that. That would be a festival that I would definitely check out. <laughs> um, yeah. You've already mentioned the cover that you did of Love Will Tear Us Apart. And now let's reverse it. If if you could choose any artist to cover any of your tracks, mm-hmm. which artist or project should cover which song? Well, that would be of ancient memory. Mm-hmm. And there's two artists that could do an amazing job with that song. Mm-hmm. And one would be Low. And the other one would be Michael Girard. Okay. Now, when he, when he heard my recording of Ancient Memory, um, it's the name is actually the Oblivion Seekers of Ancient Memory, but mm-hmm. I think it's just called the Of Ancient Memory on 13 Mass. He, when he first heard it, he loved it so much, he wanted to um, 
to to redo uh, it, remix it, and put it on a Swans album. And when I showed up there, I don't know if you've heard it, but there's so many tracks, so much stuff going on in that song. I did an, an, a, a, an amazing array of characters, meaning voices on that thing. And so there's so many, there was, and it was all reel to reel. So there were so many tracks of voices and creepy sounds and, uh, you know, recording me in different textures, like from a transistor, you know, and then from, from a big mic room. And then the guitarist, um, Clint uh, Steele, who went on to, you know, was also a Swans guitarist at one time, did all these incredible guitar tracks in the room with all this feedback. And then I did tons of keyboard tracks. So the point was, it was simply too many tracks. <laughs> and so when I showed up there with the reels, he was just, he was completely like, well, I was like, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it didn't happen. <laughs> well, that, that would be something that I would also love to hear. Um, but I can hear him singing those words. I can totally hear him singing that, and I can also hear Alan Spahart singing those words. So, oh, yeah. so our quickfire round. You will get a few questions with always two alternatives, like what do you prefer, roses or tulips, right? And choose one of them and maybe ex give a short explanation for why you choose oh them. oh no that's going to be hard to give an explanation but okay <laughs> let's start up with something easy tori amos or bjork why is that easy <laughs> because it will get more complicated <laughs> oh no uh, I can't really. Okay, well, I, between those two, I would have to say Bjork. Okay. Alicia Keys or Beyonce? Uh, Alicia Keys. That's a good answer. Um, Bauhaus or Joy Division? Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. Jersey City or Atlantic City? Uh. <laughs> oh dear uh i guess jersey city <laughs> okay yeah definitely closer to new york right uh mm. coming to new york rockefeller center or empire state building which one do you prefer empire state building okay uh i'm, I'm very sure i already know the answer to the next one but still uh neubauten or nine inch nails oh i'm starting to know about <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald or Aretha Franklin? I have to say Ella. Mm -hmm. Coney Island versus the Hamptons. I'm, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to say the Hamptons. <laughs> really? I yes. I would have bet my left hand that you would have said Coney Island. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> You know, coming from Europe. It's too much. It's too, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's true. There is too much going on there. That is true. Rome versus Paris. For me, that would be Rome. Mm -hmm. For me, it would be Paris. Although we just were in Rome this year. It's a wonderful city, I have to say that. And Georgia peaches or New York oysters? Yeah. <laughs> Neither. Ooh. Okay. Well, that's also an answer. So, Jarbo, thank you very, very much for being on the show. It was a pleasure talking to you. Oh, you're you an excellent that. interviewer. You're an excellent interviewer. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. You're articulate. Yes. Well, okay. <laughs> that's why I always write the stuff down beforehand. So, um, yeah, yeah. everybody, Sacrificial Cake is not only one of the most interesting records of the 90s, it's also being reissued, and it's on Lavender, so that's one of the reasons why the little nerd in me will, of course, get a copy of it. And maybe <laughs> you should listen to the record again and buy a copy of it. So, John, <laughs> thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. You bye too. Bye. All right. Thank bye. You. Thank you.